two, one, it's time for Let's Go Ricky Raw. For those of you complaining that we're an hour later, basically our friends, forget you guys. We're here for you and we're taking care of you and you're going to love today's show. One, because we have a fun guest in Marco Estrada. Uh, by fun means that we're able to track him down and be joining us pretty soon. Great story here for Southern California. Uh, follow his career closely. And I'm, okay, I'm bearing the lead here. Ricky, forget you. You're cool. I saw you the other day. You're a great friend. You're awesome. But, dude, did you not miss Farmer Tolly last week? Something did, was missing, man. man. Something was missing, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there was energy, but there was there was an energy to the max, you know, and, and, and he's a big piece of this, and we definitely missed him. All right, totally. Some exp- people I- got to work for a living, boy. No, Some no, no. got to work for okay. a living. I don't know if you were <laughs> able to hear the podcast last week, but I said – that there was probably no Wi-Fi and you might have cut down the tree that had the Wi-Fi? Is that what happened? That's what happened. That's the story of really sticking to it. And, uh, no, I just got tied up. I got double booked. I, I Sometimes my mind goes uh, faster than uh, what I should really be doing. So I, I apologize to all the fans. I was so bummed because it was Rock. I, he was one of my favorite dudes. I thought the podcast was great. I listened to it. Um because I did actually had the Wi-Fi, but I, so I was able to listen to it. Uh, but it was good. It was a great podcast. I mean, Brock, the best, best storyteller. He's, he's one of a kind. Dude. Speaking of, like, I know exactly what Josh is saying when it comes to double booking or losing your mind, and I'm sure you know too, Bethel, but like, there's times where I'm like, all right, I got to do this today, this, 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 and then five minutes in, I'm like, wait, what do I have to do again? <laughs> like, I just, like, my mind is like completely gone with, with the with – with the kids and it's like it's just i lose track i i sometimes hide stuff from sebastian like his like toys for like because he did something wrong or wasn't behaving and then he'll, the next day he'll be like hey can you give me my toy back and i'm like dude i don't know where i put it <laughs> we all do that happens all the time rick i see because you you guys as professional athletes are so used to having a schedule you know you got to have your routine and you're all right i get to the park at two i do this i do this and then all of a sudden, you guys are back to being civilians, and it's like, I got to go to Costco. I got to go do this. I got to do that. I got to do 8,000 different things. I got to go to the driving range, and Tolly's, you know, Tolly has a lake. He has a farm. Like, all this stuff, it's a mess. I don't know how you well, survive, you know, Tolly. Hey, I'm going to tell you right now, it's real life. I mean, it's like I, I have a 1,000 things going between travel ball, between little league, between a couple little job entities that I have, between doing lessons, keeping, like, I mean – up early in the morning planting peppers like that's what i've been doing at 7 a.m i don't know what you guys were doing at 7 a.m but that's what i do oh and my god like, yeah planting it, it peppers. yeah i mean that's what you have to do it you got to do it so it's like we uh you, you do lose track rick it's like i i mean i wish you guys would see our calendar i'm sure it's no different than y'all's calendar uh. but it's like we're at the little league field every night from six o'clock till nine o'clock Five nights a week, and it's like uh, Saturday golf tournament time. I'll tell you that. Yeah, it's uh, and all the parents that are listening right now are like, "Yeah, totally. That's yeah, exactly yeah, what yeah, we're doing." Yeah. And then, and then Ricky just finished up T-ball season. Uh, yeah, Ricky, Ricky, you were only coaching one kid, but how did Diego, the second kid, get on the team? Even though he's not old enough to play. Eight, eight kids. Well, I was coaching eight of them. No, I mean, I mean, uh, one, one of your your own kid. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I feel like. When uh, when when we were going there to, to the ballpark, it was honestly it felt like Diego was part of the team, and we literally would get we got there on uh, on Saturday, and he just tells Cara, my wife, he goes, "Mommy, run, mommy, mommy, run, mommy, run." He must have gave it like 10, 15 laps around the diamond, dude. He just <laughs> went around and around. He grabs a bat, he grabs a ball, he throws it, he chases it. And it was just like, not mommy, run, mommy, run, mommy, run, and and he just ran, 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 ran till it, like he couldn't anymore. And then um, it was cool because it was the last game. They gave him a little trophy, so we had a little like pizza um, barbecue kind of type thing, and gave him the trophies and and send them send everyone on their way. So it was it was it was cool, man. It was it was it was like it was the first experience because last year our baseball season got cut short, and it was Sebastian's first baseball season, so. He definitely enjoyed it. He says, Daddy, I don't want anybody to coach but you, so you Aww. better be coaching next year. So, That's yeah, cool. so I, we, 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 
I told him I kind of want to just sit back. I want to do what Beto does, just pull a chair out and sit back and watch everyone go to work. You know, yeah, and that's it, what you got to do. That's the best. It's uh, like I'll. Like, my, totally, I was telling him, my kid is uh, 16 now, and, like, you know, he's growing. I don't coach him anymore. I, there's no need for that. He's doing things. And there's uh, Ricky and uh, young Sebastian uh, at their final Little League t-ball game right there. It's the best, though, right, Tolly? That moment? Yeah. yeah, it's the best. We just finished up Little League. We now go to All-Stars. But, Beto, I do agree with you. Like, I love nothing more than on Saturdays. Like, Saturdays in the Little League season, it was – Effectively, all of my kids had games throughout the day. So one would be at 10, one would be at 12.45, one would be at 3 or whatever. And you just bounce field to field and watch them play. Yeah. And it's like, the patience, Rick, that you have, I got to give it to you, my friend. <laughs> I got to give it to you. JT, JT doesn't have those kind of patience, I have to tell you. Huh? That's it. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. It, I'm over here asking, like, I, I've been going to my friend's kids t-ball games because my daughter's 11 she's a soccer player my son is 16 basketball so like if i know that somebody has i like i like going there and it's what i've been doing uh, a friend of mine he's a comedian Huda moreno and and his kids play 8 30 so i go for my saturday morning run and i'll get my coffee and i'll hang out there and i'm in the outfield heckling the t-ball coach and like if the kids are running i'm like come on coach the kid's going the wrong way and it's usually his kid i'm like what are you doing and like nobody knows me because I'm not part of that team, and it's me and the kid's dad, and we're both yelling at the, the coach, yeah. what are you doing? Come on! And we're standing there with coffee, and it's hilarious. It's just fun. It's like, yeah. it's just cool, man. Well, you know my favorite part, though? My favorite part about coaching and doing that is obviously being around the kids and just – I felt yeah. like a lot of times coaches get so caught up in trying to – like some teams were like show up like 30, 40 minutes before the game and they're taking batting practice or running the bases by the game. By the time the game starts, they're like done. Our team would literally just show up right on time. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, let's just go out and play. Like I'm not going to – I'm not going to – you can't teach them at the age of five and six. Like no. I, they, 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 they're they really not oh, interested. No. Like, the dirt, they'd rather just like do their own thing. So I was like, uh, let's just go out and have fun. And I think all the kids did that. And my favorite part was – um the last three games, I started pitching to them. Oh. And I'm not a fan of the T. A, a little, a, a, you know, I never taught Sebastian to hit off a T. I always wanted him to get used to me throwing. So I always felt like he had trouble off of the T. And the last three games when I was pitching to him, it was way better. And I felt like I was more engaging and, and the kids were more yeah, into it. That's cool. Yeah. So was, that was different. Hey, Rick, though, what about uh, these beautiful Blue Jay socks that uh, Sebastian has? Dude, What's he's cool? had them like. Four years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, camp, yeah. yeah, I think my boys. I think my boys rock a pair too. But yeah. they must have been given away for free, not huh, Ricky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think they did. <laughs> but yeah, man. I mean, that that's that's the little mascot right there, Diego. I mean, he just he thinks he's part of the team. When we uh, when we did a cheer at the end of the game, he's in the middle of it. When we gave the trophies away, he's raising his hands, acting like he has a trophy in his hands. And, <laughs> That's what it's all about, honestly. I, I mean, yeah, that's what I enjoy the most. These guys, these kids, having fun and just being being kids, man. Like, there's there, you really can't teach any baseball basics yet, um, but it's more just them enjoying it. And when Sebastian says, "Daddy, I want to do it again next season," that's, that's all that matters. That's it. Yeah. Right there. And, and Tolly, you yeah. got that because you're coaching also your son's select team, right? And all of a sudden, yeah, people, it's like he's like ten, but people forget, like, hey, it's supposed to be fun still, right? Yeah. Yeah, and that's what I tried to implement. Little League, they take care of the fun part of it. Travel ball can become so serious when you're playing some of these big tournaments. And uh, and I tried to instill the fun in them and playing the game the right way and running the balls out and, and those type of things. And I think that's like that's why I find that more engaging because I don't want my kids to fall into the travel ball. Like, like you said, Ricky, being there an hour before and hitting batting practice and the kid's nine. You know, like you got to get loose. You you you're loose. You're nine. And I'm like <laughs> we hit batting practice to get loose. Like, yeah, you don't need to get loose. You got it. You're a kid. You don't need to run the bases. You're loose. Yeah, it's a you know, like, that, that, that's kind of my take on it. Yeah, it's like I miss those days, kind of, but not really. But it's cool <laughs> because I I coached my kids up until they got good. Once they got good, and you put them on like the all stars, the select teams, then it's like all right, here's a good coach right there. Yeah. I'm, I'm out of yeah. here. Now my job is to take pictures, stay in the corner, and that's it. So you'll like this one. So like my son, like I said, he's going to be a junior in high school, and he plays basketball. So it's just, he's not 
a, a, a standout by any means. Like he's a smart kid. We'll probably go D three or something like that, right? Use that to the advantage. So, you betcha. I'm, and I'm telling them, no, I'm like, dude, sure. we're going to these showcases now because coach, college coaches and scouts are allowed to be there. I'm like, hey, bro, I know you come from a school where you know team first, pass, and all that. BS. I'm paying 15 bucks to park. I'm paying 15 to enter. It's a fifty dollar <laughs> tournament and the league fees. If I see you passing, I will not take you home. You better shoot. I don't care if you're getting fouled. You are getting paid to shoot here, bro. And then he he put a one shot and he looked at me like, hey, that's a bad shot. I'm like, it's all right. I'm right here. Yeah, boy, that's a good shot right there. <laughs> Keep firing it up. Oh no, yeah. It is true though, though Beto. You talk about like uh, I call it daddy ball, right? Oh, like, yeah. at what age does daddy ball stop? We, we actually, I, I had this debate with uh, a couple of friends of mine. Um, one might actually be tuned in right now. But um, we were talking about when this stops. And, like, what, what age did, do you think it, it was for, for you and your son? Because I think 13 is almost the cut. Yeah. Like, that's where it's like, okay, we need some real coaches to, uh, to separate the dads being involved in their son playing shortstop and pitching and hitting first or second or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, we, it, I think it's a big debate in youth sports, and I think that's uh, we're, we're trying to figure that out here, to be honest. Yeah, man. People forget it's supposed to be fun. It, at every level, though, right? Even in the pro level, as much as it is, like those moments when there's no media, there's no crowd, like you guys talk about a story, like that's the fun that's stuff. The fun stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely yeah. is. Uh, yeah, Marco me. He said he's, he, he's sorry he's late, but he's logging on now. All right. So we'll get with uh, Marco Estrada. I'm glad he kind of like didn't join us right now uh, because, <laughs> I mean, we, like, that's the thing about this podcast. Like I was telling you guys, I listen to different ones all the time. Uh, and there's a guy named Keith Ramsey who is the baseball coach at Miracosta High School. He has a good podcast. I, I was listening to it this morning. Um, it's called Heading Home. And uh, we're going to get him on, and I'll talk to you guys afterwards. But Marco Strada about to join us right now. Let's see if we get him. Does he know how to figure us out? There he is. The one and only. There he is. Oh, man. I'm there he sorry, is. Guys. My fault. There he is. No, 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 no. It's all right. It's all right. Let's see here. Let me fix this. It's all good. Uh, Marco. How are you guys? Good, man. How are you? Oh, man. Totally, my man. <laughs> <laughs> Better late than never, right, baby? God bless. Yeah, there we go. All right, so let me introduce you. Marco, we are live right now on Beth the Duran. Uh, Marco Estrada, I- I'm not surprised you're late because you went to LA Unified School. So, <laughs> Silmar <laughs> High School. So, either like the Very lunch true. tickets didn't work or something was going on in the 818, but we'll be all right. Marco Estrada from Silmar High School, Glendale JC, Long Beach State, Nationals, Brewers, uh, Blue Jays, and now most importantly, on the Let's Go Ricky Roll with Josh Tully podcast. I know you, this is like a career achievement for you, right? Oh, yeah. This is at the very top. Very, very top. Oh, yes. I love it. Uh, Marco, yeah. just to give you the background, we are not going to ask you anything about baseball today. We don't care. We're not going to ask you, hey, what do you think this team is doing this season? We don't care. It's just okay, about... I wouldn't be able to tell you anything, so... Yeah, <laughs> uh, us too. It's your story, man. It's re- your story. Uh, thanks for coming on. We appreciate it. Now... I know you weren't teammates with Ricky, but Tolly yeah. is going to start this interview because Tolly, you said you had a great story right away. Yeah, I have the opener, Marco. Dude, it's so good to see you first off. But my, my opener you. is this. Marco, the first time I met you, do you remember when it was? I do. It was in my first home here in Arizona. You came That's over. Right. For... Yes, I do remember, actually, yeah. That's right. And they babysat, they babysat Camden, right? Camden was just born. We had, our wives had collect like they had met somewhere, and we meet up and oh, you play baseball? Yeah, we all play baseball. So it was wonderful, right? And then we're like, by the way, we have a party. Do you mind watching our kids tonight? <laughs> <laughs> that was my first introduction with Marco. Oh, and then we God. became teammates. Well, then we became teammates um, in Toronto, and that was uh, that right there was dynamite. How much fun was that season, Marco? Oh, the best, man. We had a blast. Uh, I will add to that story, though. The first time I met Tolly, I was like, man, this is like the nicest Christian human being. I, that's what I was thinking. He's getting cursed. He do it. I'm like, man, I, all right, this is going to be a super nice guy. And then I found out who he really was. <laughs> <laughs> and then we became teammates. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there's a different beast that comes out in the clubhouse, Marco. You know how that is. 
No, yeah. yeah, we had, we had uh, Toronto years, man. It was great. Yeah, it was great. Hey, I mean, what a what a career too. That was that's freaking. Uh, I mean, unbelievable. We were just talking about you were pitching in the postseason, and it like it puts chills in my like up my back because of uh, the big games you pitched in. And uh, I we had two yeah. on, and we did the same thing. We just reminisced, and it was like, holy shit! It just brought back the old memories of those teams, and it's like Tula, uh, that's Tula, what I miss. Tula, Tula, Tula spent a whole hour clowning Tully, Marco. The whole hour clowning me, Marco. <laughs> it was like that all year. I mean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, part, of, part of the reason why I wanted to have you on, Marco, well, obviously your story is unique, bro. You, you came from the Valley, Silmar High, and then, you know, you took the route, you know, going to junior college and then ending up at uh, at Long Beach State. And that's kind of where I, I, I saw you. And then obviously we got drafted the same year. And then to get to the big leagues, you know, a, a lot of the stuff that we talk about here is, you know how everyone's so focused on these Division One scholarships and D one or nothing, D one, and baseball's become, I feel like, so focused on that 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 we're forgetting that hey, it's okay when you when you watch the big leagues, you know, and you watch a lot of big leaguers. You guys know that it's junior college players, it's NAIA kids, it's D two kids, and 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 you know part of that man, I like my my respects to you for for all your achievements when it came to that. You know, you, you grind it away. I mean. How was it for you? Like, the, at what at what point did you think you were going to be a big leaguer, or like, did you did you think, oh, I'm good at this, I can I can take it to the next level? First of all, thank you. That means a lot to me. Um, yeah. It was a grind. It was a crazy, crazy grind. But uh, you know what? Everything worked out. Um, yeah, uh, my initial goal was just let's let's try and get college paid for. Um, I wasn't sure if I was going to go anywhere. I didn't make varsity till my senior year of high school. Uh, no way. So, and uh, so I, I was just thinking, if I can just find a way to get school paid for, because at the time, you know, Silmar didn't make me feel like I was any good, which sucks. But um, <laughs> so, you know, my, my goal was let's get college paid for. It. Uh, so I went to junior college. I knew it wasn't super expensive, but it's something that I'd be able to do and maybe get some money that way. Uh, in terms of baseball, um, and things worked out there. And then luckily I played well enough to get school paid for. And that was my goal. Um, and then probably about halfway through that season, I was thinking to myself, man, maybe I, I might be able to get drafted here. Um, so let, let's keep pushing, you know, try to get the grades, but let's, let's push baseball a little bit harder and maybe things will, you know, maybe I can get drafted and at least get a nice little bonus where I can just, you know, put it away, save and, and make something of it, uh, you know, and that year ended up being pretty good for me, got drafted. Uh, and then once I got into minor leagues, I was like, all right, well, I did what I wanted to. And I, I stuck my first year or two. I, I could not figure out a, a minor league baseball. It was, you know, my curveball just wasn't the same. Didn't have any other pitches. So I, I started messing with a changeup. And once I picked that up, then I told myself, all right, let, let's try this pitch out. We're in low A, high A. Uh, went into double A the, the, that next year with the changeup, and just things took off from there. I was like, oh, my God, I might be able to do something with this. And sure enough, yeah, it, it, I guess the rest is history. And and this is this is the thing about and Marco knows this. Fullerton, Long Beach at the time, this they, they almost got players that nobody really knew about. And and and. When Mar I remember when Marco threw against us in because uh, you were there as a junior, right, Marco? Not as a sophomore. Yeah. yeah and I remember he was throwing against us, and I was like, Marco Estrada, like, where, where did this guy come from? And he is just carved us, man. It's it's him, Cesar Ramos, and and they're just you know they're, they're you know going at it against us, and, and that was the beauty of of, of, of those matchups. Always, it was great pitching and. Marco uh, coming out of nowhere. Marco, you, and you also played with Al Quintana at Glendale, right? Al Q is... Oh, Al Q. Al guy, man. One of the greatest human beings ever created, man. This guy just does everything right. He, he's the man. <laughs> yeah. He really does. He really does. So. Yeah. Uh, Al Quintana yeah. runs uh, Legends Baseball Academy in Pasadena where Ricky would throw totally. And I kid you not, the nicest person I've ever met. And I've never heard anybody say one bad thing about him. And then you talk to Al, like, hey, Al, you were a legit catcher. He goes, oh, I was on teams. 
<laughs> like, you were in triple a dude like you're legit He's like yeah but yeah whatever <laughs> yeah, yeah they, call, they call that humble uh-huh. right. <laughs> but yeah I, 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 oh go ahead no go, no rick go, finish, finish what you were no, saying no, no, no. Go, ahead, go ahead go ahead no i i was just saying watching watching your change up over those few years i mean i always know even when you were in milwaukee and playing against you that you always had a good change up but i saw something over those years that was so special do you think in your mind it was different then than it was even as you were coming up through professional baseball because that was Uh, that was like johan santana style milwaukee twins uh, (laughs) changeup um you know it's weird because when i figured out the changeup in minor leagues that's what got me to the major leagues i get to the major leagues and i don't want to shake anybody all they're calling is fastball and I'm going, yeah. man, I need to say something that I don't really like my curveball. We we just never went it. And it didn't go so well with Washington. So then I get uh, ruled five with Milwaukee. And even then, my first year or two, I didn't really use it as much. And I think, as, I think it was 2011 where I finally started using it, and then things just got a lot better for me pitching-wise. Um, it took a couple of years, you know, in the major league to actually save and get that change of going because everybody thought I was a fastball curveball guy. Um, yeah. And and then sure enough, you know, especially once I went to uh, to Toronto, changed my mindset. Still had the same change up. I thought just decided to make it my pitch. Um, that's where things really took off. And you know, you you were there for fifteen. And, um, it, just, it was a completely different – that was with uh, Mark Hurley. You know? Right, yeah. Right, that's what I was about to say. Like, I think there was two people that I watched. Uh, number one, tell the people about the influence that Deanna Navarro had because I was a personal catcher for a guy, and I, I'll just say that he was probably as close to a personal catcher as you can. I've never seen two dudes mesh. Like Marco and Navi met. Wait, Donald Navarro, he, he was like five foot six, right? That guy? Yeah, he was like up to my waist. But let me tell you, you want to talk about another great human? He goes right at the top of that list. Oh yeah. Huh? Yeah, he was Marco, with the he was with the Dodgers for a little bit. Uh, and I because so I spoke Spanish, he was like cool. Then one day he's like, Hey, I'm going to Disneyland tomorrow with my family. And I'm like, all right, cool, bro. Like, cause I was like the only Mexican reporter around there, right? Mark, Mark I, I'm a reporter here in LA, so I'd be in the clubhouse. And I look, I remember him talking, and I'm like I didn't want to be a jerk, but I'm like, bro, like, don't you know how far Disneyland is from Dodger Stadium? He's like asking me direction. I'm like, this is another day and a half for you, but he got there. <laughs> so that was your guy, yeah. Deanna? Yeah. Deanna was, so was Russell and Tony. Uh, you know, with Russell, um, they, they kind of just threw Navarro at me one day, and I, I threw a great I, – I, I don't remember the first game I pitched with him, but I know it was a good day, and they kind of just said, hey, let, let's – keep using Navarro and the more I, I pitched to him the more comfortable I got and just the thinking part of the game went completely away from me I, I didn't have to think anymore I let him call everything I, I didn't <clears> shake him more if you saw me shake it's because he would ask he would tell me to shake um because I, I didn't shake again for the I think the rest of my career um <clears throat> but it was it was him it was between Burley uh, kind of showing me that having that mindset uh, to, to slow down the game, make it easier for you. It's hard enough as it is. You know, the, the scouting reports that the team gives you is one thing, but they, they don't – like who else threw slow like me and, and had a right-handed change? It's not a lot of guys. You can't really <laughs> down report the, the 95 on our start. And I just didn't have any of that. Um, what was your so spin rate? I mean, yeah. <laughs> Your spin rate. A spin rate, yeah, good spin rate. Um, <laughs> said, hey, uh, let's just try to remember the little things that, that worked for you and then forget about everything else. Whatever the catcher tells you to throw, throw it with conviction. And I, I, that's what changed my career right there is, is having the conviction behind every single pitch, no matter what it was. And there were a few times where I I'd, I'd kind of would disagree with it and instead of stepping off, I would make the pitch, but there's no conviction. And I swear, most of those times it was a home run. Yeah. This is crazy work. Not That's having true. 
That's true. Yeah, yeah. it really is. It really is. I mean, just the second the second you doubt yourself on that mound, you're like, oh man, like I don't want to throw this pitch. I know what pitch is the right pitch to throw, but he put this down. I don't want to shake. Here you go. And the next thing you know, yeah, it's it's it's, it's gap or over the fence somewhere. Um, but the pitches I had the conviction behind, I swear there's only a few where were hit hard. You know, for the most part, when you were committed, hundred percent conviction. It just it would work out for me a lot more than second guessing. See that that's, that's, a, you, that's real baseball talk right there, totally. Yeah, I'll, hey, and I'll tell you this, and, and and Mark will back me up here because he he was he was in it firsthand. If I'm if I'm starting a baseball team right now, Gianna Navarro is my starting catcher. Like just the guy was like a wizard. He gets no credit for it either. Hell, the guy's been limping around trying to find jobs. I think. Over, I think he's now retired. I haven't spoken with him in a while. But, like, this is a guy that has unbelievable knowledge of game calling. I've been in, I was in the game for a while, and I, I felt like I had a good grip on game calling. But I'd sit on the bench and talk to him when Russ would be catching, and we would just talk about sequences and, hey, what would you see? How'd you do it? And, like, he was so good at that. And, you know, I know we laughed at Marco, but he's like, Marco's stuff was – high pass balls, change up occasional breaking ball, but he always knew the spots to flip the breaking ball in when I can use it. I mean, Al Barco, that one year you could have told the guys the change up was coming and they were swinging and missing at it, right? Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) So humble. (laughs) All these humble people on here, damn it. (laughs) Say you're nasty, Marco. I was nasty, remember? Dude, this is... Nasty, I was at a buck fifty. Totally, totally. Nasty. Let me let, let me tell you this, totally. So where we grew up, so I grew up in Carson, Ricky, East LA, Marco, and Silmar, and I think I saw you pit, pitch in high school, Mark. If I'm not mistaken, because um, I was coaching at Carson, uh, I think when you were in high school, whatever. Anyways, um, for any of us from LA Unified, that's our school district, to get to any professional level of anything, totally is like, damn, you guys made it. Let alone two pitchers at Long Beach and Fullerton at the same time. Now you got me as a reporter. So this right here is this fake humbleness. Because I walk around like, man, hell yeah, I made it. What, fool? Because like, <laughs> we're, we're, we're told. Fake humbleness. I like no, it. Because we're told we're not supposed to. Look, Ricky played at a high school where they didn't have a field. And uh, Mark, Mark, your high school, they had the old cage on top. It's not these open fields. Like, it looked yeah. like chain link fence. It's like. Like, the yards you play at for Little League are way better. Like, so scouts don't come to Silmar. They don't go to East L.A. So, Marco, when you get to the minor leagues and you get drafted, did you ever be like, what the fuck? Where am I? Like, you're you're in Binghamton, New York. Like, there's no tortillas there, bro. Like, there's there's no, like, the people are eating black beans, not be- brown beans. Like, it's different, right? Oh, man. <laughs> really different. I ended up in Vermont. And, Vermont. You know, yeah, I was in. I mean, holy smokes. I'm talking about a hundred plus year old stadium, terrible place. And, and you know, I'm, I'm thinking, oh, I'm professional now. We're gonna have some awesome fields to go to, and I end up there, and I'm going, wow, this, this is the clubhouse. <laughs> the near clubhouse. Hey, 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 the clubhouses were nice, Rick. Uh, uh, Marco, clubhouses no. were really nice. I'm sure, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Freaking dumpster <laughs> fires, aren't they? Yeah, we no. were- to reiterate what Beto was saying at our field in East LA, we we used a county field because we didn't have a high school field and we didn't even have a mound, JT. No mound. Come on. It was flat. it was flat. It was flat. So when we'd go to other high schools, like nice high schools that had a mound, it was like, thank you. And I remember when I first when I first signed uh, in Toronto, I think somebody was trying to fix the mound and and they're like, hey, is this is this? They asked me. They're like, is this good? And I was like. Come on, bro. I was like, I come from East LA where I didn't have mounds growing up. This is per- like you ain't gotta do anything more. And, it, and it's true. true. It, it's you you're you're content with whatever they give you when you first sign. You're just like, oh my god, this is cool, and we're gonna play in cool stadiums, like like Marco said. I show up to the New York Pan League in Auburn, New York, and it's like, wait, take me back to Fullerton. <laughs> <laughs> so Long Beach has unbelievable mound, like all that yep. stuff, you like it was just completely different. Yeah, we were so spoiled I, in long here with that mound and the the stadium, especially back then when we played. That stadium was the graveyard. I mean, yeah, you know, so it's a pitcher's dream. Um, so it was a lot of fun getting a chance to play there for sure. 
Mar- Marco, well, when you get we- drafted, um, how did that happen? Like, how did the phone call go? Where were you? Like, wh- what was that day uh, like for you? Oh, yeah. Um, so I had been getting a lot of calls. You know, you're going to go from, you know, second or fifth round, this and that. And I'm going, man, that's awesome. Well, so I'm paying attention, to, you know, because we didn't have any of the MLB network stuff or any of that. Um, so I was on the computer just, you know, watching the, the, the ticker go by. And all five rounds passed me. And I'm going, wait a second. I didn't get drafted. Like, everybody told me fifth would be the latest. This sucks. Like, I'm over it. I don't even want to see it anymore. So I actually went to my room, just started watching TV. And my mom and my girlfriend at the time, uh, well, she's my wife now, but my girlfriend then, she, you know, my mom, see, and they're like, hey, we completely missed it, but you were drafted. I was like the third or fourth pick or second pick in the sixth round. So I just missed it. I walked away. No one knew I got drafted. Until, like, one of my other teammates gets drafted. And I'm going, wait, he got drafted before me? And they're like, oh, shoot, we missed it. You were already drafted. I'm going, oh. So it was, it was like a bittersweet moment. Like, obviously, I was excited, but I was like, damn, like, I didn't even see it who, go by. Who did you think you were going to? Who, were, who was the team that was locked in that you were like, oh, this is, this is where I'm going? It wasn't Washington, I'll tell you that. I didn't talk to them one time, which is crazy. Really? Uh, and I remember I kept all, you know, all the, the, the letters you get from each team, the questionnaires and all that. And I had, I didn't get anything from Washington, so I, I definitely didn't expect them at all. Uh, I was thinking like Anaheim or Dodgers or, you know, some sort of California team, but no, it was the complete opposite. <laughs> <laughs> and how, how did you, so your mom and your girlfriend tell you, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Four years earlier, you couldn't even make the starting rotation at Silmar. Like, the Spartans didn't give you a spot. You you told J- Glendale JC, hey, I'm coming here. They didn't recruit you. You went on your own. Like, you're at Long Beach. Um, they, so, Eddie Camacho, which I think you guys oh. know. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, Eddie Wait. What's Eddie Camacho doing? Oh, my God. The best dancer ever, Eddie Camacho. <laughs> Eddie Camacho, that's right. No. That's that dude, he, Camacho works with Al Q. Yep, yep. Yeah. Okay, oh so my I, God. Um, they were at Glendale already, and I think they had mentioned my name, and I think that's why I was recruited oh, okay. by Strauss, John Strauss at the time. He was a the manager there. Um, but I, I'm pretty sure if it wasn't for them two saying something, I, I probably wouldn't have got looked at. No way. See, okay. yeah, so it's like, what's going on? You were trying to figure things out. There it is. But that day, once you did realize, fuck, I got drafted, like, what were the emotions like for you? Well, the first thing that came into my mind was, man, I've never really left California. Uh, <laughs> now I have to go to New York. Or no, sorry, Vermont. And I have like a week to get out of here. Like, So it, 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 I was excited, but like nervous. You know, I've never left. The furthest I had gone was Long Beach, 45 minutes drive. <laughs> You're such a Mexican. Yeah. Such a Mexican, yeah. man. <laughs> like, Stay here, man. In like two homes, you know? So I was used to that and I was leaving my bubble. So I was, yeah, I was nervous, uh, but excited. And once I got out there, I was like, man, this, this kind of sucks right now. But it took me a few days. I got used to it and, you know, it, it was a lot of fun. Now, do you, you go from Washington and you become a, a Rule 5 draft pick and then you go uh, to the Brewers, correct? Yep. Who was, when you get to the big leagues there, how was that call up? Like, um, Take us back through that to that time where, you know, obviously you talked to us about the draft. What about that call up when, when you finally get the call to, to go up to the big leagues? How was it? Who'd you call or was it yeah, emotional? I got, I got called up with Washington and Oh you did. Um, yeah. And uh it was cool because I, I walked into the clubhouse and the manager calls me in. I'm going, all right, what did I do? Like am I in trouble? I, I don't remember doing anything wrong, but what's up? And the guy Hey, I don't know if you saw, um, there's a trade. And I think they traded Luis Ayala, I forget to what team, for someone. And he goes, um, well, I guess you're part of that trade. I'm like, dang, I got traded? All right. Well, <laughs> what am I? He's like, no, 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 I didn't say you got traded. I said you're kind of part of that because he's leaving. You're getting called up. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so I called my girlfriend, my mom, and uh, – it was emotional. I, it was something that just I didn't expect. You know, I was having a good year, 
But I figured, you know, I'd, I'd probably need another year under my belt in the minor leagues to really get going. And um, it just kind of – it was unexpected for sure because was – at the time, there was a lot of – What's that? You get called up out of AAA? AAA, yep. Who? Marco, who are the veteran guys on that team? What year was that? 2008. 2008. 2008. So that was, uh, God, I, I can't even remember names. I'll tell you right now. Don't worry, Marco. That's what I'm here for, baby. You, you just keep Ryan, telling us the good stories. Ryan Zimmerman was a franchise. He, he was a – he, 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 he would have just – he would, Zim would have just got there, right? Yeah, Zim, Zim, Zim was called up right away after he got drafted. So you got Aaron Boone, Felipe oh, really? Lopez, Ryan Zimmerman, Willie Harris, Lasting Millage, Austin Kearns, uh, Willie Mo Pena, whatever that guy, yeah. uh, Dimitri Young, Paulo Duca. Uh, pitchers wise, you had Marco Estrada, Tyler Clippard, John Rosh, uh, Chad Cordero, Chief, Odalis Perez, Jason wow. Bergman, Sean Hill, uh, Ray King. Oh, Ray King, that lefty. Oh, yeah. Ray King. <laughs> You have some veterans on that team. Who, who took you under your under their wing? Like who took you um, under your like there that was like, hey, um, come come follow me. What's that? Who who took you under their wing? Like what pitcher when you got called up, or was were you kind of alone and kind of shy? I mean, did you know some of the because you you probably hadn't been to big league camp yet, right? Nope, no big league camp. Um, so I didn't you, know anybody. And then yeah. uh, Press took me under his wing. Um, even though he was a starter, he still kind of took care of me. Um, and, you know, back then, the hazing was allowed. And I had a kind of rough coming up because I was I was the only guy. You know, I was in a September call, but I was in August. So it was like, all right, we got one, and we're going to rip him apart. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's sweet. That's sweet, right? And, and it finally got to the point where, you know, guys were asking me to go get them food or a drink or this and that. And O'Dallas is like, dude, like, you get up. You got arms and legs, and, and if you look at those guys, some of those pictures on that list, they didn't have um, yeah, they, not, they, they didn't have much time. They were kind of around your age too. Exactly, and they were the ones. Yeah, mine is Ray King. My Ray King could do whatever he wants. He's thirty-four at that oh, no. time. Yeah, I, if he wanted something, I went and did it. You know, actually, uh, to your point, Marco, uh, the only person over thirty was Ray King. Pitchers. Yeah. Right. So imagine, you know, you're getting hazed by all these young guys that are probably about the same age you are, but because they had a couple months in the big leagues, it was kind of hard. And I, and I would do it, but O'Dallas was like, no, this isn't happening. Like, so he I, kinda, hope, I, hope he, the, I hope the chief treated you right, man. Yeah. So I didn't <laughs> get to play with him. Um, and I, I, I talked to him a few times. He was a great guy, but yeah, I didn't really get to uh, play with him. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if he was hurt that year. I never saw him. Probably. Yeah. yeah. Um, John Roush? Roush, man. Roush took me out to dinner a few times. Great guy. Yeah. Big, intimidating, man. He's scary. He's eyes. Out and <laughs> great guy, it's though. Scary. He, he, was, he, he told he, me he, one he, time in spring training with the Mets, he says he was getting rocked. I don't even know if he got it out. And he said to me, he comes in the dugout, throws his glove. Oh, you got to call my slider. I looked at him, and I was a young kid. I, I, I was just over it. And I said, hey, your head goes like this, too. <laughs> as much as it goes like this, it goes like this. Krause is like 6'10", 6'11". Yeah, 6'10", yeah. eyeballs, I look like eyes, tattoos everywhere. You're like, oh, this guy's going to kill me. But he just, it, it just went on for like 10 minutes. I gave him the first five minutes. I said, okay, I won't say anything. I'll use his slider more. Next time I catch him, I never caught him ever. So I don't know what the guy did. Like Mark, would be like me putting down a curveball for you every pitch. You're like, yo, I don't throw that many curveballs. I just didn't know, right? So I yeah. said, Roushy, come on, your, your head works in both ways. He was totally. my teammate. In, he was my teammate in Toronto, and I. And <laughs> yeah, we'll just leave it. <laughs> okay, uh, back to the Marco Estrada story. <laughs> I know for a fact. Well, I know for a fact we had Frank Francisco on the team, and I know there was a few times where he challenged them to to go behind the the left field wall and, and oh, really drop. Him. Yeah, there was a few times. stories in that sense, uh, but he, he treated me. Good. That's all. Because you're a nice, humble kid from Silmar, man. Everybody's yeah. nice to you. As a monster, I'm not going to say wrong to him. That's why. <laughs> I'm a nice. I'm a nice guy too, right, Marco? 
you said that at the entry of the show. I was a nice yeah. guy. I Real. was a nice guy. Real. <laughs> you are. You are. You are. Hey, Marco, you get to uh, major leagues. You see a uniform with your name on it. How did you feel? Oh man, it took me a while to like. I was in such awe. Um, I just wanted to see the entire stadium. And I think it was the – it might have been the first year that that – no. I don't remember what year they had that stadium, but it was pretty new. And I just wanted to see the entire thing. So it took me a while to get to my locker. Um, once I got there, I, I just – I couldn't believe the size of the locker. And the jersey might have been the last thought, to be honest with you. And I just – I was trying to take everything in. I ran into the kitchen just to see what kind of food they had. Uh <laughs> Man, I, you know this is big ones. So, it, yeah, it was it was surreal. Something you'll never forget for sure. And um, Mark was actually when he went to Toronto, Beto, uh, he was actually traded for Adam Lynn. Oh yeah, big yeah. guy, another big guy. Yeah, so I was Adam, Adam Lynn for for Marco, one see, for one. And Mark, as you can tell, we go down memory lane, and uh, you know, totally has some good stories. Ricky's got stories. The first time you got on the showbird, the big league plane, what were you wearing? Oh, I wore a suit. Um, and that's the one thing I remember that I didn't like. No one got me a suit. And no so way. I made, yeah, I made Same sure, here. like, as soon as a rookie comes up, hey, what do you want? Like, because I, I would watch guys buy suits for other guys, and it never happened for me. I don't know why. Same here. See, that, that's hey, that's what, nope. that's, nice suit. But that's what's horseshit. And I've told veteran guys this before. You want you want me to go get your food and your drink and get your luggage off the off the back of the truck at three o'clock in the morning when we get into a hotel, but yet you don't you don't get guys anything. I was lucky. Our my veteran guys that I had to do that every freaking road trip, carry their bags on and off the plane and get them off the truck at four in the morning. Like they always took care of me, so I was fortunate in that way. That's that's horseshit, Marco, because. You do all that work, and they want to bust your balls the whole time. At least, at least treat my guy something. Give him a nice little Lucian bag or something. This is what I was told. I was told this. I was. Told, I won't mention any names. I won't mention any positions. But this is what I was told by a veteran guy when I made the team. The he's a first rounder. He can afford his own suit. Oh. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that. And I was like, all right, cool. Like I could. I'll, I'll, don't worry. I got. I got myself. Don't worry. I. I'll, right. I'll go get it. All right. Yeah, but wasn't a first it just. Rounder. In the memory, I was like, all right. <laughs> Mark was like, I wasn't a first rounder. I wasn't on TV. I didn't even see my name on the computer, man. <laughs> yeah, no shit. I didn't even see me get drafted. What the hell? That's great. Hey, but, That's great. But, all right, so, Marco, when you get on the plane, though, come on, man. This ain't Southwest. Oh, yeah. No. I mean, the showbird, I mean, it, I've never seen planes look like that. You know, you're used to flying Southwest with three seats next to you or whatever, and you show up, and the plane we had that year with Washington was, like, one of the best planes I've actually ever ridden on. You had the, the huge tables, you know, the rounded couches. And um, Whoa. and Eric decides to tell me, hey, uh, rookies sit in the back. So you guys know veterans sit all the way in the back. So here I go. And I, <laughs> oh, no. I love it. And sure enough, a veteran comes up to me and goes, hey, rookie, what the hell are you doing here? Get your ass up there. I'm like, oh. I go to that guy. I'm not trying to call anybody out. So I just, I go up to this guy. And this guy had a few months in the league, too. I'm like, dude, what's your problem? Like, why would you do that? Like, just made me look bad in front of everybody. And he just starts laughing. I'm like, all right, I guess it's the way it is. So my day wasn't a great experience. But yeah, the flight was unbelievable. Guys are playing card. in you know, expensive alcohol come out, and, and just the food yep. was amazing. Everything, yeah, it was, it was awesome. Marco, wine, wine, whiskey, or beer on the bird? Well, now I it's know, whiskey. I know the answer. I know the answer. <laughs> Marco, always bring that nice bottle of nice bottle of scotch for us. Yeah, yeah. So I switched from scotch to bourbon. Obsessed with bourbon. I've got a huge collection now, and I, it's almost a problem. I need to slow that one down. No, that's well, right. No, that's right. We're, we're good. Marco, yeah, I'll tell you what, after this, I'll text you my address. I got plenty of room in my basement for the stuff that you don't want. I told Beto the same thing, and he sent me some, so that was nice of him. That's gone. Oh, Marco, 
Oh, hold on, Mark. Mark, do you know anything about Tolly's life right now? No. Oh, let me fill you in, my man. Okay, so. <laughs> the um, is huh? this where you going with the pause or? No, 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 no. Let, let, me, let me fill you in on uh, on Tolly here. Um, so Ricky and I have been doing this podcast for a couple of years, and you're one of the original names that we wanted to get on. We just could never find you because you don't exist anywhere on the internet. Like we can't find you anywhere. Which is good for you. Except baseball reference. And that's the only place. Baseball reference. Yeah, yeah. And I'm good yeah. at finding out stories about everybody. There's You don't exist, bro. So congratulations. Um, yeah. So Ricky <laughs> and I we were talking. Ricky's like, hey, Tolly's a great storyteller. Maybe we can add him to the podcast. We had taken a break. And I'm like, yeah, Tolly's awesome. He was one of our original guests. He's fantastic. So Tolly was in the Yankees organization last year. He's not officially retired, but he he's out there, right? So we find out that Tolly, I knew him as a guy that played for the Mets, Upper West Side, lived all over. The dude lives on a farm in upstate New York. He is now Farmer Tolly. If you text him today, he'll respond three days from now. He has no service. He has his own pond. He's building a schoolhouse. He chops trees down. Uh, he knocks down chimneys, and he's growing habaneros. Am I wrong, Tolly? <laughs> You're spot on. You're spot on. <laughs> chopping trees, though, Marco. Let's talk about chopping trees real quick. Chopping trees is a little more than chopping trees. This is a big logging expedition that we do. This is like bulldozers and skitters. This isn't like, oh, we cut down some little sapling trees and they fall down. No, we're talking like 200-foot ash trees right now. Come tumb tumbling off the hill. That's not the yeah. totally I need. See? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> stop there. People change, Marco. They change, bro. Marco, Change. Hey, it's what this world's about. Change. People change. It I is. change. I change. It, <laughs> I love it, Marco. Marco, I love it. Yeah, as, as, as we said, as Beto said, like, it's just nice, like, now that I'm not playing, it's nice to, like, just kind of be somewhat secluded You during the season. And, and you guys can speak to this, for goodness sake. Like, it's just people nonstop. Every day is people, 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 fans, people. 185 days straight, 200 days straight. And so you just want a little uh, serenity. And that's, uh, I found it. I found it in Binghamton, New York. Yeah. And this last year and a half has been my favorite year and a half, even though we, I mean, obviously the pandemic and um, it's terrible what's, what's going on in the world, but things are getting better now. But I will say for me, being home, forgetting about baseball, the pressure, all that stuff, man, it's been, it's been nice. Really That's good. what I say. I, I don't have to go over four anymore. That's the nicest thing. <laughs> I, have a, I have a shitty day at golf. It doesn't really matter. I go in the clubhouse, grab a six pack, and uh, call hey. it good. Uh, hey, yeah. Mark, as, Tulo, as Tulo said, this guy acts like he uh, he was an everyday catcher and it was very stressful. <laughs> Tulo said he had to catch one guy and one guy only. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't hey. talk to that way. <laughs> hey, Marco. Marco Tulo gets on. He says, "Oh my God, you were the worst Major League Baseball player I've ever played with ever in my life." He said, "You, you, you screw off for four days. Then all of a sudden, oh, now you got to catch. Now you're locked in." He said, "Then you got another four days off to screw off you for another four days." Starting rotation uh, program. We'll yeah, we Five days. Yeah. 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 <laughs> me, and, me and Marco. Me and Marco hung out a lot on the bench. Oh yeah, <laughs> a lot of Marco Estrada stories on the bench. You're perfect, Tony. You're oh, perfect. Yeah. And, and you, both of you guys were part of those years, and and I love hearing stories about about those years. Tulo told some good stories about those those teams that were close to to reaching the World Series. And Marco, I was telling Tolly before you came on that it was uh, I read something somewhere on a Jay's website somewhere on a blog, and they were saying that you were probably one of the most clutch pitchers in Blue Jays history. Um, and when you take us back to those years, what what's the first thing that comes to mind as far as the team and, and the team that you guys assembled? Because that team was freaking loaded, man. And I got released in fifteen, so I, uh, I I got to watch it all from uh, from TV from my TV back home. So what what's the one thing that jumps out? Like I mean, you guys came so close to to reaching the that special place that everyone dreams of. Yeah, and. You know, the, the one thing, that it's it's almost regret, right? You look back and you see that team and you think, how did you guys not sweep the entire everything, like the playoffs, the, the World Series? How did you not take it all? Um, it's been it's been a letdown because I, I still think back to that year. I'm going, I, you know, look up the roster, see who was there, and I'm going, how did we not win? 
How do we not win the entire thing? We were yeah. stacked, completely stacked. You know, and hats off, obviously, to Kansas City. They were obviously stacked. Uh, a bunch of great players. I just thought, I thought we were better. And hey, uh, yeah. at least on paper, right? Like we had all the big, huge names. Where, yeah. where were you? Where were you sitting when Bautista hit the home run? Man, that one. Also, another thing. <laughs> I had just gone to the restroom. They th- they they asked me if I could uh, if I had an inning or two in me. So they they threw me in the bullpen because uh, I can't say no. So I went to the bullpen. I went to use the restroom. As I'm coming back, all I see is the ball up in the air and the crowd going nuts. So I like I basically <sighs> missed. <laughs> because because all, all I've all I've heard and all the players that I've ever talked about was that's the loudest they've ever heard the stadium. One hundred. I mean, and we've been to a lot of places, heard a lot of crowds. Nowhere has been anywhere near as loud as that. That bad. I mean, it was crazy. Yeah. I mean, that place, that place was rocking. Oh, oh, rocking. Yeah. yeah. It, it was that nuts. Was, yeah, that was. Do you, guys, I don't know. Do you guys hey, think how about, it had, how about the eleven and run? How about the eleven game winning streak we had? That's something that always stands out. I've never done anything like that on a team where you rattle off 11 in a row. I mean, you you talk about getting on a plane flight after you've just won six in a row. You get on the plane to go to the next city, and then you go to the next city, you kick the shit out of that team for three days, and then you hop on the plane again, you go to that city, kick the shit out of that team for three days. That was kind of like our – that was our MO. I mean, that's what it was, right? I, and that I remember – I remember losing the one game we lost during that span or that 11-game winning streak that once we broke it. I remember everybody's mentality was like, you know, they, they got lucky, fluke, we're just gonna go on it again. And I think we went on a nice little run again. But it was like nine. Was like, oh, we're gonna win four or five, any possible who cares? It was crazy. I've never been on a team that Yeah. <clears throat> it was wild. So much fun though, wasn't it? It was the best time. I wish we could yeah. see them. It is. It is a little bit of a letdown, like Marco says. Though it's crazy because it's like being on those teams, and I, I mean, I, I was just I wasn't even active for the postseason. I was just the class clown that kept the morale up, you know. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was. It felt like holy shit. There's nobody's ever gonna beat us. And when we did get beaten, Kansas City had a great team that year. But I mean, you go back and you think of the play in the little triangle between Gogo and Bautista when a fan yelled, "I got it! I got it!" And they both pulled up, like that. That was kind of the that was the end, you know. It was like holy shit. If Batista doesn't hear anything, catches the ball, or Gogo catches it, what exactly. happens? And and win the series, and then sweep the 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 Mets like Kansas City did. Yeah, yeah. is that what really happened? Is that what really happened? A fan, a fan. They 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 thought a fan a fan yelled, "I got it, I got it," and they got confused. All right. I believe so. I believe that's the story, right? Because they were both going back on it, and no, neither guy said anything. They, that's just how you r- run those plays, right? The outfielder yeah, yeah. goes, but, the outfielder uh, goes underneath, and the infielder goes over top. Yeah. And the fan yelled, "I got it!" And I think they both they both pulled up. I, I mean, I don't know. They they can confirm it, but I believe that was the oh, story. Outfield advantage. That's what it's about. I mean, I, I feel like that had a little bit to play it with Elvis Andrews too in Toronto and, and all that stuff happened. And he started. When does Elvis Andrews make errors? You know, and and it seemed like that that game in t- against Texas when you guys that the, the the bat flip game. It just seemed like the guy couldn't feel the ground ball all of a sudden. Yeah, that was crazy. Think- That's actually the craziest inning I've ever experienced. Um, with everything that happened, you know the play before where Russell throws the ball, hits Chu, uh, yeah, the bat, bat, scores. Next inning, bloop here, error there, misplay. Like, what is going on? It was nuts. <laughs> and then the back flip happened. Yeah. God. It was- hey, hey, real quick, real quick, Marco. I, I this is something that we I meant to talk to Tulo about, and I forgot. How about the resilience that we had? Remember, we, we lost to Texas. We got down 0-2 to Texas, and we had to fly to Arlington. And we had to yeah. play two in Arlington, and we had to win both, and then come back to Toronto for one game. And I'll yeah. never forget, after we dropped to Texas 0-2, 
we get on the flight, and you would have thought we just won. You would have thought we won both games. We just swept them at home. The confidence that we had was like, oh, okay, they might have got us twice, but we're going to get their ass these next two times. And we came out on fire. Yep. It literally felt that way. Uh, and I actually pitched that, that next game. So it was the elimination game. Um, and I knew, I knew, I swear I knew. I was like, man, we're going to score like 10 runs today. Like the way we got off the plane, the way we acted after a lot, like we're going to destroy this team tomorrow. And sure enough, I mean, early on, I think it was it was a close game. Um, but then we ended up just coming out, swinging bats, and, yeah, scoring a bunch of runs. Yeah, uh, and then the rest is history after that because we got – we caught absolute fire. Did it, did it ever bring you back, Marco, when you're going through those moments where you're pitching in an elimination game, you know, and you're representing a whole country? Did it ever bring you back to, like, man, look how far I've come? I – dating back to my high school years, to my college years. Did, did you ever reminisce? Did you ever get a chance to kind of sit back? Or was it something that, was it now that you're you're retired um, that you think about? Or were you ever like, you know, on, on the plane or as you're walking out, are you like, man, I'm really, I'm pitching an elimination game. It's do or die or my team gets goes home if I don't, if I don't bring it today or we, we, we live to see another, another day. Yeah, um, I was weird about that stuff. I, I never looked back and said, oh, the, the kid that could make, you know, varsity out of high school until his senior year. So I, I never really went back and thought of things like that until now. Now I look yeah. back and go, I, I didn't have it very easy. I, I had a tough road, um, you know, got to work now, pissing some great games, had a lot of fun doing it. Um, but, yeah, I never really looked back and reminisced about how, you know, Things were so bad to, you know, here I am now pitching the elimination game. Uh, and then I got even weirder during the playoffs. I never thought about any of that stuff. Like, the playoffs gave me – I needed more adrenaline, I guess, uh, because during the regular season I, I felt like I didn't have much going until the playoffs. And then the playoffs was like, oh, baby, I'm awake now. I feel great. Uh, but you forget, oh, we're down 0-2. No, I never thought about that stuff. I just – kind of told myself, all right, I'm going to go out and, and try to deal today, and that's it. Damn. See, that's what the podcast is about. It's This is what we do. We reminisce. Now, all of a sudden, we're like, they did this, I did this, I did this, because in the moment, as athletes, you guys are the 1% of the world. You can't be thinking about what happened 10 years ago or let alone 10 minutes ago, because Tolly and Ricky and Marco, you guys got to get locked in on the site in front of you, right? But now, you have a chance to breathe a little bit, and you're like, damn, I was badass. Like, 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 like it's okay to say damn like what did what did uh alan trejo tell us the rookie that has only been what twenty thousand major leaguers in the entire time yeah. and like yeah. you guys yeah. like how many billions of people have lived in this world like it's amazing what you guys have accomplished and that's why we love having the podcast it's a chance for just to tell stories and kind of reminisce a little bit like fuck look where i got from man like like this is cool yeah. now marco it, for you all right i know you went to dodger stadium as a kid the first time you went to Dodger Stadium as a pro, how many people asked you for tickets? Yeah. Um, well, all my friends and family are really good about that. Uh, a lot of them just told me they were going to go. I don't know if they were expecting me to say, hey, I'll get you tickets. Um, but I did – and I learned my lesson when I first got called up. I had family out there in Washington, and they basically went to every game. And oh next thing God. I know, gone. And I'm going, wait a second. I didn't think it was going to get, like, this crazy. Um, so after that season, I kind of told everybody, hey, listen, I, I can do a couple here and there, but you can't expect me to keep doing this, you know? Um, so when I went to L.A. and played the Dodgers, um, I had a lot of friends and family show up, but I only, I basically only gave tickets to family, and that was it. All right. but how? So when you get there, Ricky's told the yeah. story, totally told the story. When you're in the outfield, people are yelling your name. You can't hear them. Right? So everybody thinks you're stuck up all of a sudden, right? Yeah, no. So it's hard. It's kind of empty. Uh, but it is, it's really hard to, to hear anything. Um, but I've got a kind of cool story. So I'm a huge, huge fan. You know, I was a huge Dodger fan. Uh, even bigger fan of Vince Coley. Like, this guy put me to bed so many nights just listening to the games. It, it, I love his voice. Um, so I'm, I'm talking to Bob Euchre. And because we were with, uh, I was with uh, Milwaukee, 
I'm talking to Bob Euchre and I'm telling him how I, I, I love you, Euchre, you're the man, but Vince Coley, I grew up listening to this guy. Like he's the man for me. He's the legend, this and that. And he's like, you want to meet him? And I'm going, dude, like seriously, I would love to meet him. He's like, okay, I'll see what I can do. Well, Sure enough, I get to the locker and I'm thinking, and at the time, the place was not renovated, so those oh, yeah. lockers were <laughs> terrible. Yeah. yeah. And I get there, and out of the corner of my eye, I see Vince Scully walk in, and I swear I started shaking. Like, I've never been starstruck. That was the one and only time I was, like, in awe. And sure enough, Bob Uecker goes right to him, and I could hear everything, and he goes, hey, I've got this kid from San Fernando Valley, huge fan, wants to meet you. And Vince goes, yeah, the kid from uh, San- the Silmar, Marco Estrada. And I was like, no way. He knows my name. <laughs> like, this is insane. <laughs> and I'm thinking, and, you know, they come right over, and it's just getting worse and worse. I'm getting, like, anxiety. Talking about it right now, I'm getting, like, nervous. And- <laughs> I love uh, that. And I, yeah, I got up. I shake his hand. And, ah, oh, what, what an experience, you know, just meeting someone that you looked up to for so long, listening to his voice for years and finally getting the, the chance to be a special, special day. That's the only guy, and unlike like Marco, only guy I ever wish would have said my name. I never got to play at Dodger Stadium. That's the only guy I ever wish. I just wanted him to say my name out of East Los Angeles. The whole story, like like Marco says, he knew who he was from, where, where he was from and all that. I, wa- I wanted that. Like, I wanted it so bad. And I was like, every year when the schedule would come out, are we going to Dodger Stadium? No. I was like, ah, Lee. And then they... The year I got released, or two years later, they ended up coming. But I was like, God. Ah. But that, that was that was that was the guy I wanted too. Yeah, and Marco, that old uh, clubhouse was really, really tiny. It was like a high school locker, gym locker, so it was real small. And also, I'll tell you this, because as a reporter, we would hear stories about Vin doing stuff like that. You could probably set it up a day ahead, because Vin would never go down into the clubhouses. So for him to go there, that's even more. He probably went just for you, man. Yeah, that, that's insane to think about. And Euchre, he's right up there with Dude. Vince he's the man. I, I've never seen this guy upset, ever. And I, I was there five years, and he was in the clubhouse every single day. Yeah. Now, I'm upset about anything. Yeah, my buddy, uh, Joe Block, who does the Pirates uh, radio now, was with the Brewers, and he worked with Euchre. And I'm, I'm Joe Block. Oh, Joe Block, the, the, he's the best. Great, good dude. Uh, um, so I would when Joe would come to town, because Joe used to do the Dodgers radio here, pre and post, so that's how we became friends. And he gets the Brewers job. And I was never one to be like, oh, let me go see somebody because announcers. But I'm like, that's freaking Bob Euchre. That's Mr. Belvedere, right? I wanted to go by there. And I'm like, ah. And he's like, hey, uh, Bob said he'll meet you, but if he'll do it in the in the uh, dining room at Dodgers, in the press room. I'm like, cool. That's great. I didn't want to picture it. I just want to introduce myself, say he's awesome. And as I'm doing that, I'm talking to Euchre, and Vin comes around. And all of a sudden, it's Vin. Euchre and Fernando Valenzuela standing together, and I'm like, Oh my god! And then Jaime Harin <laughs> comes through, and we're by the ice cream machine. And I'm yeah. like, I work for ESPN Radio, I have to I have to do my first radio hit at like in five minutes. And I'm like, Fuck, do I leave or do I go do my job? And I'm just standing there, and I'm like, Fuck, they're calling. I'm like, I just stood there, and it was Bob and uh, and Vin just telling stories with Jaime and Fernando, and I'm just standing there, like, Fuck, I'm not leaving, bro. So I get a call from my boss, I have to get, Hey, you missed your hit. I'm like, I told him what happened, he's like, Okay. That's the only time you can pull that card. <laughs> it was fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Those, that's Freaking a special awesome. right there. Holy smokes. That's awesome. Yeah, and he knew everything about you. He probably said Ciudad, Obregón, Mexico. He probably said all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, is that where you're, is that, that's where you're from, right? That's where your family's from? Yeah. Yeah. Sonora, Mexico. Yeah. Did you ever play winter ball? What's that? Did you ever play winter ball? No, uh, you know, I have a cousin out there right now. He's been playing. He loves it. He's having a blast. Um, but I, I've been invited, well, basically every year that I played, I was invited out there. But, you know, as a starter, you just, once you're done, man, you're done. Uh, I don't know how people keep playing. I wasn't able to do it. So, you know, I, I haven't been able to get out there. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm, feeling- uh, I'm sure Gallardo would always try to recruit you. And when you guys were in Milwaukee, right? Giovanni was a yeah. big part of the Mexico team. We would have guys come to us and be like, dude, like, here's your jersey. It's ready. You know, we're waiting for you. It's like, man, I, I can't. I threw 100 innings, 100, 200, whatever. 150. Like, I'm not going out there anymore. I'm tired. Hey. So, yeah. 
Mark, Mark uh, get in this group right here, guess who's the legend in Venezuela? In this group? Yeah. Well, I want to guess Romero, but... No. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Come on, Marco. You know better than that. Holy <laughs> Champion de Bateo. Oh, I knew this, yes. Yeah, I had to tell you. I had to tell you on the plane flight after a bottle of wine or something how good in Venezuela I was. You're right. I, I knew um, that. <laughs> hey, Marco. We, hey, speaking of, you know what? Some of my favorite stories are, are like in the clubhouse or on the, on the plane flight. We were talking, and Marco, Marco would love this. When when me and BJ Upton would always go at it because of my wine suit, remember that? <laughs> I had the Cabernet the Cabernet wine suit. Well, I remember the the rules started to change, and we were allowed to wear jeans and a nice shirt. Well, Holy, being the professional that he is, would still show up with this this suit, man. And, and I because I was a big fan of wearing suit. Um, but yeah, once they went away, guys would just fully apart because you wear the same suit. <laughs> yeah, I had the wine suit and the blueberry suit. I am. I was rocking them hard every trip. <laughs> BJ would be a good guy to get on here, man. I'd, I'd like to see him and you go at it. You'd laugh. Let me tell you, you'd laugh so damn hard. Oh, I mean, my stomach would hurt. I'd laugh so hard with that dude. He'd get me going. Oh. That's it, man. <laughs> Mark, Marco, dude, was this fun? Oh, so much fun. You guys are the best. Man. Right. All right. We're going to get you back on. We'll have you on. And like Now that you've actually done a legit interview with us and you're good and you realize we don't care anything about baseball currently, this is fun. I love it. Yeah. No, this is great. It's All right, good so, to catch up. Yeah. So what are you up to now? Golfing. A lot of golfing. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm still working out. Not not for baseball. Um but I need something, right? I, I got to do something. So I work out. I don't want to just sit on my couch. And so working out and, and golfing minimum once a week. So I'm, oh, wait, I'm, come on, bro. You got to get on our level at least three. Yeah, these guys play like every other day. Half of the time they don't respond to me because they're on the court. They're at Torrey Pines or uh, all these fancy courses. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Ricky's retired. I got no job. So what are you going to do? I, I would if I could. But my back is still – Pretty oh. messed up. Yeah, it like I golf once and I'm hurting for two, three days. Oh, but it, really? It's still yeah. it's still that bad, huh? So yeah, it's gotten a lot better. Like I can get out of bed without any issues now. So that's a that's a positive. Um, but yeah, once I golf, it, it I'm struggling for a day or two. Um, and I Damn. tried the three days in a row last weekend. It was tough. Yeah, I had a rough, rough outing day two. Day three yeah. wasn't as a2 is really bad. Before we let you go, before we let you go, I, I got two questions for you. One, um, who is the one hitter that comes to mind that just completely owned you? That you're just like, yeah, I still think about all all the shit I went through with versus this guy. Who's the one guy that just? It, and it's every, I actually have two guys. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, I, have, I, I can go on, but. Uh, the, the main guy I would say was Yadier Molina. Uh, I don't know if he had any home runs off of me, but I swear every time this guy came up, he just found a way. Uh, whether it was hard contact or weak contact, he he was finding a hole somewhere. And I didn't mind him with, you know, bases empty, whatever. Like, oh, well, you're just going to get a hit, a double max, no big deal. But it was with runners on, like, here we go. I'm going to be down 2 nothing now because this guy's <laughs> – and he was impossible for me to get out until I got to Toronto and started, like, things changed a little, and I finally did a little bit better against him. But before that, being in Milwaukee, facing him a million times, hated it. Yeah. Yeah, in the division, that's probably the worst, huh? In the division when a guy owns you? He completely you, owned you. Yeah, you see him 50 times in a year. That was the worst. Uh, Did you? And then, what's that? No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Finish. I, I, I'll ask it. Starling Castro was different. Starling Castro hit a flare over second base every single game. And it got to a point I would tell the right fielder, hey, can you please play in? He's going to – I'm going to get ahead. I'm going to get him <laughs> to come to, and he's going to flare it right there. And still, they wouldn't move. 
and he would flare it right there. I swear he did it like three times a day. I, I asked that. Uh, it might have been Batista that I asked to move, and he didn't do it. I don't remember who was playing right, but it was during Toronto days, and sure enough, here comes freaking Starlin. And right there, three times, three hits. Like, how many times have to, like, please just move over there. He's going to hit it over there. <laughs> it's all you did. I, I wish I could, like, go back and see how many of those flare hits he had. See, now with the shift, oh, he'd be out every single time. Be out every yeah. time. Uh, yeah. Do you want to know your numbers against the Adier? Oh, is it 500? Four something? 600? Five, 519? Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. Yadier, uh, in 27 at bats. He had 14 hits. Uh, you did strike him out six times, though. Ooh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I really don't know, though. Did we have a Estrada Tolly matchup? Uh, let me, I gotta, check let me scroll that. all yeah. the way down. He's waiting for it. He's waiting for it. I go like, <laughs> he doesn't have anything. How many times would you have faced him, Tolly? No, I was with the Mets. He would have been with the Brewers. That would have been it. Yeah, I don't, I, don't, even, I, don't, I don't think I do. I, I don't even see Tolly's name on here. I must have been playing that day, Marco. <laughs> <laughs> Tolly had a day off. Tolly had a day off. Again? Again? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, Marco, we like to uh, finish up with this. So, um, you know, you have a unique story. Everybody has a different path to whatever dream they may achieve. And, you know, Tolly signed out of high school. Ricky out of college. First rounder. You're a sixth rounder who didn't even know he got drafted. Yet, as you said, you didn't know at a high school what to do. Best advice you would have for high school Marco Estrada? Well, well, the one thing that just kept me going was, you know, I I grew up with a single parent, just my mom and I, no siblings, nothing. So I knew I I had something to work for, and I had to become something no matter which route I would have taken. But I knew whatever route I was trying to get to, I wasn't going to give up. And in high school, I was told no numerous years, didn't care. I knew baseball was a way for me to get college paid for. So I started with small goals. And then obviously the end goal was the the biggest, and and I'm glad I was able to do it. But I always started with small goals, and I pushed as hard as I could. No matter how many times I heard no, I just – I didn't give up. And and I know it's so cliche. Everybody says the same thing, never give up. But I'm I'm telling you, if if you want to do something, anybody can do it. If you just push hard enough and you can't take no for an answer. And I heard more than anybody. I promise you guys, it was a constant no reminder. And I didn't care. I just pushed, pushed, pushed. And, you know, ended up getting to where I am now. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Uh, we do have an update. Estrada versus Tolly. Uh, Tolly, do you remember it? No. Marco, do you remember? It happened one time. Once. Once. Estrada versus Tolly. Punch out. I wish we can really run tape on that at bat. Hey, that's fake news. <laughs> fake news. <laughs> wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, wait, 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 wait. hold on. Let me just make, let me just clarify. Yeah. Hold on. It's one at bat. Let me just clarify. It was a punch out. Oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Wrong category on baseball reference. Yeah, flew out to the track. Walk. That's about right. (laughs) Especially my Mets days, Marco. Just ass out, flipping balls, foul, 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 foul. Most guys are like, hell with it. Go stand your fat ass on first base. You're not stealing anyways. (laughs) It's all right. You know what I remember is in spring training, I faced you, and you hit a rocket to right. Really? (laughs) It was an out. You hit it pretty good. Yeah. yeah. And then, and then, I, cause I threw you fastballs. I was like, whatever. Let him get himself out of screen chain. And then I threw you yeah. chain. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably real. Yeah, that's probably right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, this was good. This was good. Ricky's been wanting to get you on for a while, man. We appreciate you, Marco. Uh, we'll have you yeah, back on you, in Marco. a couple months, man. Pre- appreciate you coming on, brother. Thanks, oh, Marco. Thank that was awesome. Good to see you again, too, man. Good seeing you guys. Good seeing you, Tolly, Ricky, man. You guys are the best. Uh, and if you guys are ever in Arizona. Or- yeah, we're going. Yeah. We're in a- yeah. Our, our go- all golf clubs travel. We will go there. 
Uh, we, 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 we'll be there. We'll take care of you. Marco, appreciate it. And uh, when we go, maybe I'll take you LAUSD Chalupa or something, man. We'll, we'll take care of you, bro. Uh, hey, yeah, it's Tapatio. No Chalupa. Uh, 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 see, this is, a, this is a good kid right here. All right, Marco Estrada, appreciate it. We'll don't, don't forget the LSUSD coffee cake either. Hey. <laughs> uh, <let's go. laughs> totally has no idea. All right, Marco, just hang up and then uh, you're good to go, man. Enjoy the rest of your day. We'll talk to you soon, Marco. Thank you. See you, Marco. What a dude right there. What a dude, man. You're right. You're right, Ricky. You're like, I've been wanting to get this guy for a while and then we got him finally. And uh, just a good dude. He uh, opened up and some good stories. He's great. Oh, he's so funny. He laugh your ass off. He get telling stories after a bottle of wine. He, he just, he, he's an unbelievable human being, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, no, he really is. He And like I said, I, I knew him a little bit. I knew a bit of his story. I didn't get to play with him, but I really always enjoyed watching him pitch because he went out there and pitched. And it was it was, it was a, a, a thing of beauty. A, you know, it was like a thing of art. You know, this guy could paint every corner. He can throw a high fastball whenever he wanted to. And then that changeup, it was just, as Tully knows, it was one of the nastiest changeups in the league, and it was unhittable. Like he said, he could have told hitters it was coming, and and they they would still have no clue. And and again, we talk about what's missing in today's game. We see a lot of hard throwers and this and that, but to me, that a guy going out there grinding for seven eight innings with the stuff that he had, he made the most of it, and he really didn't care. The guy probably acted like he was throwing hundred miles per hour. He knew he was confident in himself. He was going to go out there and get the job done. Yeah. You know what? He he had absolutely huge balls on the mound. Like, yeah. he, and he had like he said it. He's like, hey, I wasn't going to overpower anybody. I had a pitch, but he come right after that. There was no no backing down. Yeah, that was really yeah. cool. Thanks everybody uh, who waited and listened around. Make sure you guys share the podcast a like. Uh, go to the Instagram page. Let's go, Ricky Road. Tag that you're watching. Leave the comments on iTunes. I do see them on iTunes, Spotify, and also on Instagram. Do you have something, Rick? Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say I, I like hearing those, even though it's it's uh, bittersweet for me hearing those fifteen, sixteen stories, just because yeah. Toronto has a soft spot in my heart, and and just hearing these guys tell those stories, it just it almost makes me feel like I was in that. It, it makes me feel like I was in that clubhouse, you know. Yeah. And, and these guys reminiscing, and I'm and kind of pumps me up just to to listen to it again. I, I wish I would have been a part of it. Um, whether it was like like Tom said, he was a he was in on the roster in the playoffs, but it's still. He still made it fun for himself and, and being part of that team. Like I'm like, man, I wish I would have had surgery and just, you know, and, and just kind of if I was on the DL, been there and seen it all and experienced it all, I, I, you know, anything, you know, and, and, and it, it hurts a little bit. But it's cool that, that I get to live it through these guys and, and, and that moment, those special moments that the Blue Jays had during that time. Well, me as a, a guy who lives in L.A., I remember watching that game going, damn, that's cool. Joy Betts had the big – now having – Heard from bats and heard from different guys. Heard the stories like, damn, you, you like you want to like, I go back every now and then on YouTube just type in yeah. a bat because every I'll do it again too because now I'm looking. Okay, Marco was in the bathroom when he hit that home run. Like, how crazy yeah. is that? It, it's it's crazy because I feel like every guy was obviously you're not sitting on top of each other, so every guy was doing something. Yeah. You know, totally whether it was totally somewhere in the dugout, Tulo, maybe somewhere else in the dugout, Estrada in the in the clubhouse and. All that stuff, I, I, it's cool because everyone is very unique in, in, in sharing their story of that moment. Yeah, Marco was awesome. And, Ricky, I noticed that you wore your Cal State Fullerton shirt today when the uh, Long Beach guy came on. Oh, dude, I didn't even – I noticed it like halfway through. I, I seriously, I didn't mean to. <laughs> I just love it. Yeah. Love we it. Need, they need a new head coach. They need a new head coach. Yeah. Uh, coach totally. Hook just retired. I'm for hire. I'm for hire. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'll, I'll, come, come live in the OC, man. Yeah, I was uh, I was waiting for him to start talking about Long Beach, but he never did. I was ready, Rick. I had my Long Beach shirt ready to go for uh, you. I knew you would. I knew you would. I knew you would. <laughs> no, yeah, I, but I mean, it, 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 honestly, like those 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 years of, of college yeah. baseball, you know, Beto, you you remember them a little bit. Yeah. Um, and going to Blair Field, it was packed stadium. I I, I feel like the rivalry's missing that yeah. a bit nowadays, but it was like legit full stadiums Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and we had some fun matchups against those guys, and you know. Um, uh, obviously, things change sometimes in the program, and being a Cal State Fullerton alumni, I hope they bring in somebody that that uh, that gets that program back to where it needs to be. Coach Vanderhoek had a great career there, and you know he was he's always treated me really, really good, and um, you know I have a lot of respect for him, so I wish him the best. 
Yeah, be it's a damn good program out there in Fullerton. All right, let me look, read some comments you guys from uh, Instagram. E Holmes nine oh eight said, "This is awesome. I can't wait to hear Marco with you guys." This is from the earlier Pantor four who supports us a lot. Derek uh, Marco always struck me as a good interview. Uh, look forward to hearing it. And like in the beginning, he was very professional, right? Like because nobody knows what to expect with us. Oh, yeah, they're talking. And then after it's like, eh, fuck all that. Fuck the humble. Let's go. Let's just go right there. And you see how they open up totally, right? It, it just yeah. boom. Yeah. yeah. Marco, Marco's much like Tuo, same way. Very reserved, very quiet, won't yeah. say anything. You get him in a one-on-one environment, like you said, whether it's like on the plane or in the clubhouse having beers, talking about the game, he opens up. But yeah. you get into an environment like this, most dudes are just, yeah, everybody's like a little timid. But yeah. once you, once they get comfortable, it's on like Donkey Kong. I tell yeah, you that. once he was like, yeah, this and that. And I like how he was like, man, they didn't buy me a suit. Like, hell yeah. Hold that grudge, bro. Yeah. Hold yeah, that grudge. Right, here's, a, here's, a, here's a comment that came in from uh, Terry Mack. It said, this is the first podcast I've listened to and I'm now hooked. I have a 13-year-old that plays travel ball and is a good player, but could be great. He struggles with the mental part of the game, which I'm guessing is a huge part. He's very hard on himself, and it shows in his body language. I've talked to him many times, but sometimes I think kids just don't hear from mom and dad. I let him know it's a game, and he should be having fun out there with his friends. Any advice for a kid on the mental part of the game? Keep up the great work. Thank you, guys. I do. I actually just had a long conversation with one of my high school kids about this. Um you know, one thing that I remember is it took me a while because I got drafted. Like, for example, Ricky goes to college. I'm in high school. so It took me a while to mature into professional baseball. And I remember realizing how hard this game was when I got into professional baseball. And Gary Carter was a guy that was like very he, – he was my first manager. He was very um, – I don't know what word I'm looking for, but what he sat me down and said, you're going to struggle. You're going to have bad days. Don't worry about it. Number one, make fun of yourself. Number two, every day is a new day. And those, those two things, I think, and I think it happens with young kids because they don't, they don't let it go. They just, they hold on to it and they feel the pressure of mom and dad. But when you, if you can make fun of yourself and if you can move on day to day, I think that's what that's what alleviates the pressure of the mental side of the game. Yeah, and it's true. And and for me, it's don't make things a bigger deal than what they really are. It really is not the end of the world. It really isn't. You know, I mean, you you play the game, you go out there, you have fun. It's cliche, but it really it's as simple as that. For me, where I fell. Um, where I, the trap that I fell into in my career was that I made things a bigger deal than they, what they really were. If I went and had a bad outing, it was like the end of the world. It, yeah. So I know exactly what, he, what he's talking about, what he's going through. And when I had a chance to really reflect on it and look back, it was, why did I make a big deal out of something that wasn't that big of a deal? Hmm. And, and sometimes that drains you mentally, physically, and, and, and you, start try, you start trying. You start trying to be good. You start trying. The minute you start trying, it's it it doesn't go your way. It's like things have to come to you, and and just go out there and 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 forget about it. I mean, once once one outing is done, it's it's on to the next game, and that's it. And and just go out there and have fun, trust in your abilities, and everything else is gonna take care for itself. Once once you're on that on that in that batter's box or on that mound, once a pitcher releases the ball, there's nothing you can do as a pitcher. You know, you don't control what's gonna happen, what the hitter is gonna do. Same with the hitter. Once he hits, puts the ball in play, I mean, he doesn't control what the infielders or outfielders are going to do. So you go out there and you have fun and you, and you just enjoy the game. It sounds simple, but and it is. It's hard to do. No, it's hard to do. It's hard, it's hard, hard. to do. Dude, it, I mean, 13 is a, is a little like there's the pre- – I think it's more the pressure of the teammates, the mom and dads, the coaches. It, it, it's more that pressure, right? And I'm a big advocate. And you, my, I wish my nine-year-old was standing here. Because I push the every day is a new day. When you're horse shit, you're horse shit. Just laugh it off. Mm-hmm. And he did. I, and I was so proud of him because the other day he went 0 for 3, a weak ground ball to the pitcher, and two just absolute horse shit at bat punch outs. And he gets in the truck, and I don't say anything. He's like, hey, what you, would you think tonight there, bud? He says to me, he goes, uh, he starts chuckling. He goes, well, that was pretty bad, huh? 
<laughs> and started laughing. I said, yeah, that was bad. No, I said, that was, that was shitty. That was, you're right. It was bad. So um, he says, well, Dad, he says, we'll play tomorrow. Tomorrow's a new day. First at bat of the next day, punched out. So he said, oh, shit. Now it starts snowballing, right? Now it's like, uh-oh, the wheels are turning. Now the kid put together a great at bat. His next at bat hit a double. And then you can see the pressure relieve off of him. But my point that I'm trying to make is most kids would let it snowball because they're so uptight of what's mom and dad going to think? What's my coach is going to think? Oh, my God, I'm not going to play. No, this game is too hard. You're going to play. If you're good, you're going to play. And you just have to you, you just take one at bat at a time and enjoy yourself. Because let me tell you, it doesn't get any easier. No. Enjoy it while you're 13. The shit gets really hard. Yeah, you get it, it, it's true. I mean, nobody, nobody's – there's no cameras in front of you. There's no – so why make it a big deal? You know, like, like like Josh is saying, there's the next day is a new day, and it's a chance for you to get better. Either you, either you get better or you're going to be left behind. Simple as yeah, that. And I, mean, I, mean, I, got booed, I got booed by 40,000 of my own fans, for Christ's sake. <laughs> you know how hard that is? That's demoralizing. Hey, huh? That's telling. That's telling. It wasn't. It wasn't forty thousand, but I got booed plenty of times in Toronto in two thousand twelve, and I'll never forget those moments. And they're, they're shitty. They make you feel shitty. You feel like you just want to crumble into a little hole and 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 just never come out again because you're like, I'm not trying to suck. You know, I'm not trying. I'm 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 trying to uh, you know put on put on a show for you guys, and um, it's not fun. But at the same time, like I said, when I had a chance to realize it and sit back after I retired, I was like, it wasn't that bad. I mean, yeah, the numbers weren't there, and. and Shit didn't go my way, but maybe if I wasn't so hard on myself, I could have probably lasted a little longer in my career. You know, it's funny, right? Yeah, you're right. It's funny, though. It's like the Blue Jays in Toronto is when I got booed. I was catching RA, and I was having the, the knuckleball was moving all over the place, so I'm running to the backstop, and there was a guy like three rows up above home plate, and he's just berating me the entire game and boo and going crazy. And after about the fourth knuckleball that got by me, I'm running back to get the ball. And he is like leaned over screaming at me. And I don't like to use the F word on here, but I tell you, I looked up at the guy. I got the ball. I called time, looked up at the guy, and I said, you catch the fucking thing like that. And it made me so, so good. I said, yeah, you catch the damn thing. I was so pissed off. I was like, what the hell, dude? Like, It's yeah. like I'm, I'm catching a dude that throws a knuckleball. What do you want me to do? You know, and, I, like, I, and we understand as professional athletes that once did it, you understand that fans are going to boo, they're going to cheer, they're going to do whatever they want. You don't have any control over that. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, there's nothing worse than when you're struggling and you're trying to do your best at it and it's, like, not going your way. And it's, like, it just the, the pressure of it just continues to amount and you're just, like, yeah. all right, what do I do here, you know? And, um yeah. Yell yeah, at him. Yell back at him. Yeah. Two just, hours of berating. Two man. hours of berating. I'm coming at you. I'll yeah. tell you that. Just yeah. remember, and, 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 baseball's easy from the podcast host. It exactly. really is. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and it really yeah. comes down down to this, as cliche as it sounds. Baseball is a game of failure. It really is. Yeah. You know, it, it doesn't change yeah. at whatever level you're at. It doesn't change. And and the the quicker you realize that, hey, if I go for four, I know I'm gonna come back the next day and 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 put good up ABs and if it doesn't go my way you got to look at some positive and then just build off of that yeah and yeah. Uh, every week is a positive because we continue to get better and better on the let's go Ricky roll with Josh Tolley podcast we're here for you every single week uh I, hold on I actually I gotta figure something out are we having a show next week because I might be busy golfing oh you gotta go my, my, my new my new friend Marco Estrada said come out to Arizona uh <laughs> hook line and sinker yeah you know no uh, we, I am available next week um, um yeah next tuesday uh next wednesday is a big day for me um you know we're uh we're cutting the babies off so um wish me luck on that so it should be fun to do that you know <laughs> wait you're doing what uh the romero team is set it's officially oh, over. it's gonna be officially over yeah. Oh, I got it. Okay, I got yeah. it. Easy, so, easy. Yeah. Piece of cake. Yeah. So one of hey. those one of those kids better be a stud. You've done it already? Yeah, I've done it. I've done it right away. Isn't it? That's reason now. <laughs> hey, uh, piece of cake. Uh, let me tell you a great story. I was oh, partying. Please do. I, it was my night before I was going in, and uh, you know, Ricky, you know Jamie McGinn, 
he was playing for the Avalanche at the time, and they had some party going on. So I go over to Jamie's apartment, and Danny Breer was there who was playing for the Avs at the time. And he had like five kids. So, yeah, I got it done. He says, listen, one thing when it happens is you're going to smell a burning sensation. So I'm like, oh, okay. All right, well, you kind of brushed it off, right? Well, you smell a burning sensation. So just brace yourself for that, Rick. It's uh, – I, if I was you, I was ready to go. I, I was fine the next day, but I milked this thing for the seven days that the doctor told me. Um, Damn, the doctor, nice. the, doc, the doctor said in two days I'd be ready. Yeah. No, tell him seven so you can hang out for like a few extra days, laying on the couch, watching some Bro, TV. I already read the, the paper that they gave me. Oh, was like, Damn it. Yeah, dude. I, 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 new doctor. New doctor. <laughs> And, um, we could. Bet, bet can, we do a, can we do a live, can we do a live showing, Ricky, while you do no. that? No. Why? <laughs> Just for the fans. They love it. Yeah. <laughs> nobody nobody has ever done that. I can guarantee it. For that. a reason. <laughs> you don't need to see it. Anyway. I don't even, I don't even no. like, yeah, just yeah. talking to the doctor it, about it. That guy, is, he made it so easy. So I'm just yeah. uh, going in. He's like, follow my directions and yeah. you'll be good. Our friend Ruben Polanco says it's gonna smell like burnt tortillas. Exactly. All right, uh, we will have a show. We'll have a show next week. Uh, just to give you guys an update on me, Friday I'm gonna give the commencement speech at my high school. What? <laughs> <laughs> they they comment. And I'm like, are you serious? Like me? And they're here's the first thing they said. The full suit and everything. Dude, they're gonna give you a capping gown and everything. And I'm like, how am I who didn't graduate college, barely got out of junior college, gonna be telling these kids? I'm like, oh, fuck. so I got to fake it. Yeah. And then they tell me, um, can you keep it real short? And then all my friends that are teachers there, they're like, dude, you're the commencement speaker? What the fuck? That's all we got. <laughs> That's our best bolt right now. <laughs> oh, jeez. Hey, well, congratulations, man. That's be fun. I mean, you're probably going to rip it to every kid. I oh, can't no. Really I'll be like, you too can dream. You can also do a podcast from your garage. No problem. Yeah. No problem. And while you're doing it, listen to our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Another edition of the Let's right. Go Ricky Raw. We'll talk to you guys next week. Farmer Tolling. Best of luck. Good Ricky, boy. I'll talk to you later. See you later, guys. Yeah.